the New England chapter of Sabre tonight. We welcome longtime Sabre member Sam Bernstein. Sam founded the Elysian Fields chapter in New Jersey and has contributed to numerous Sabre publications over the years. Tonight, he'll be presenting Home Run, a history of the long ball, exploring the fascination of the home run by looking at the sluggers who made the long ball popular. Sam, welcome to Northern New England, even if it is snowing like mad out here. Thank I'm you great so for much. Tonight. The floor is all yours, my friend. Happy to. Okay, so can we get to the, uh, how do I get back to the PowerPoint? All you're going to do is hit share screen down at the bottom. Share screen, okay. And you should be in find your PowerPoint and it'll come right up. All right, does everybody, everybody see it? Yep. We're all set. Okay, all right. All right, let's hope this works. Let's hope the video works. Let's hope everything works. And if, if you can, if you can hear the videos, uh, let me know. Okay, and we'll we'll try and work that out. Okay, so why do we have this fascination with the home run? Is it the most exciting uh, playing baseball today? Why do we love to witness the crack of the bat, the trot around the bases, the sneer from the batter, and the sigh of disgust from the hurler's face? Home runs have accounted for the most consequential changes in, in close games. We cheer great home run hitters, especially those who are setting new records. And we remember those records more than any other in a game overflowing with statistics. From the very beginning of organized professional baseball, the debate between putting the ball in play versus the long ball raged. Jared Diamond, in his book, Swing Kings, commented on slugging in the early development of baseball. Quote, while they were rare, home runs were an attraction from the very beginning. The ability to drive the ball far, to send it soaring high in the sky was sexy. It was exciting. It was a sign of immense strength and power, of great masculinity and virility. Even back then, chicks dug the long ball. From 1876, when the National League was formed until today, there have been 22,534 Major League players, 235,700 games, 4,156,519 innings pitched, and 327,412 home runs. In 1901, 16 teams in the National and American League, hit a grand total of 455 home runs, an average of about 28 per team. In 2019, that same National and American League, consisting of 30 teams, walloped a record 6,776 home runs, an average of almost 226 per team. In the past six full major league seasons, an average of 5,872 four-baggers were hit each year. By 1858, the New York City metropolitan area was a hotbed of baseball activity. As most serious baseball fans know, the game initially began to take hold in the New York area as a sport over a decade prior to that in time, in 1845, when Alexander Cartwright, a ball-playing enthusiast who was by profession an engineer, propo proposed to other like-minded ball players that the game they began to play with some frequency be organized. <laughs> by, the spring, by the spring of that year, in quick order, the boys found a suitable ground in the Elysian Fields in Hoboken, New Jersey, to play baseball. The club would be called the Knickerbockers, and on September 23rd, 1845, baseball's first organized set of rules were crafted and adopted. The following year, the first record recorded baseball match occurred between the Knickerbockers and another New York-based club, and shortly thereafter, other amateur clubs were formed around the New York City area. Soon the players sported colorful uniforms and special caps, and by the early 1850s, the game was so popular that the New York press began to take regular notice. Baseball, the Sunday Mercury exclaimed in 1853, is not only healthful, 
but it is played in the great outdoors and excellent games are now at hand. By the 1860s, baseball's popularity skyrocketed. For the first time, the New York Times regularly covered baseball and gave the fans what they wanted to read, namely information about their favorite teams and players and routinely began to report on how teams fared against one another. It seemed that baseball fans just could not get enough of the game that was quickly overtaking the genteel English game of cricket with its ties to the motherland. Soon, baseball became the number one spectator sport in America. Until 1869, baseball was primarily played by amateurs and record keeping was sporadic. Henry Chadwick, one of the early journalists who wrote about sports, began to develop a scoring system or box score. Several years ago, an original handwritten report from an all-star game played in 1858 surfaced and it told an interesting story. 1858 was a watershed year in the history of the game that would soon become known worldwide as the national pastime. By late January, when the New York winter still left a, a chill in the air, there was a call for a meeting of all organized baseball clubs. A month later, representatives from well over two dozen New York City clubs met. There was even a group from outside of the metropolitan area, the Liberty Club of New Brunswick, giving the assemblage a national look and feel. William Van Cott, a local municipal judge and baseball enthusiast and a member of the New York Gotham's Club, became president of an association called the National Association of, of Ballplayers. This was not a players union as professionalism had not occurred yet, but it was the first formation of a league with a schedule and rules. At that 1858 meeting of the NABP, the gauntlet was dropped and a challenge was made when the Brooklyn clubs challenged New York clubs to a series of contests where the best nine would be decided on the diamond. How? Well, each region was to pick their best nine to play against one, one of those of the other region. In other words, there were to be no ordinary games. They were to, be, they were to match the most skilled of the Brooklyn ball players against those from the New York ball clubs. It was to be organized baseball's first all-star game. Better yet, there would not be just one game, there would be a series. What is also of supreme importance is that at some point, whether at the convention gathering or soon thereafter, it was decided that to attend the games, the fans would be required to pay a then hefty 50 cent admission. Thus, for the first time ever, money would be charged for fans to see the game. Sure, the money derived from the first All-Star Games would benefit New York area fire departments, so the games had the air of charity attached to them. But put in its proper historical perspective, the mere fact that a charge was levied and collected for fans to enjoy the contests were unquestionably baseball's very first major step in its rapidly approaching status as a professional game. According to a surviving scores report, from this game on July 20th, 1858, John Henry Holder of the Brooklyn Excelsior Club was credited with hitting the first known home run. The game took place at the Fashion Race Course near Flushing, Queens. The New York team defeated Brooklyn 22 to 18. Until 1869, most baseball clubs were amateurs and while some teams charged a small admission to cover expenses, the game was played for exercise and enjoyment. There were men who received money to play, like Lipman Pike, who was considered the first professional player. But for the most part, teams were made up of club members representing their organizations. In 1869, a team of all professional players was formed in Cincinnati, and this changed the game radically. In 1876, a professional national league was established and subsequent pro leagues were created over the next 40 years. George Wright was one of the founders of the Cincinnati team and he hit at least 49 home runs during a two year barnstorming tour. However, his home runs are not considered official 
because his team was not in the league. When he jumped to the Boston team in the National Association in 1871, his statistics were now legitimate, and he hit 11 home runs in a 12-season career. Similarly, Ross Barnes started his organized career with, the, with Wright in Boston, but he jumped to the Chicago White Stockings of the new National League in 1876. And on May 2nd, he hit the first National League home run against Cincinnati. It was the first of 40 hits that initial season and the first of 158,000 hits by National League players in the next 146 years. Harry Stovey was one of baseball's first dual threats in the early development of organized baseball. He possessed a rare combination of power and speed that set him apart from other 19th century players. He was also an innovator on the base, path, base, base paths, introducing sliding techniques to the game that had never before been seen before, never before been seen. In his 14 year career from 1880 to 1893, he belted 122 RBIs. So in the era between 1876 and 1919, a batted ball was considered a home run where it landed since there were no foul poles in left or right field. In some ballparks, there wasn't even an outfield fence. The rule read, the umpire should judge the ball fair or foul according to where it disappears from view. In this era, there were only two umpires in the crew, so without foul poles, many fly ball home runs were called foul. Prior to 1920, once a winning run had crossed the plate to end the game, the batter was only credited with the number of bases needed to accomplish this. For example, if you hit a game-winning home run in the bottom of the ninth inning with two on base and your team losing by one, you were only credited with a triple. In 1968, a commission determined that 48 hits should be reclassified as home runs. Babe Ruth was now credited with an extra home run, giving him 715. This caused an uproar and the change was rescinded. Baseball historians claim that since the, this rule was in effect at the time, these were not home runs. Prior to 1931, a home run was credited if it bounded into the stands fair. This rule was gradually changed to a ground rule double. The American League ended its bound rule before the 1929 season and the National League before the 1931 season. So, For the 1920 season, a home run was counted as a fair ball if it passed over the outfield fence in fair territory, but not where the ball landed. Foul poles were then being installed and by 1929, these foul poles had to be at least 25 feet above any fencing. Game-winning home runs were now scored as home runs. The spitball was allowed, and putting substances on a baseball was, were, were also banned. Teams could register a pitcher who had thrown a spitball before 1920, so that pitcher could continue the practice. Burley Grimes continued to legally throw that pitch until he retired in 1934. Outlawing the spitball was advantageous to the hitters. Also, if an umpire determined that a baseball was scuffed or discolored, it was removed from the game. Prior to 1920, one baseball was usually used for the entire game. In 1885, outfield fences had to be at least 210 feet from home plate. In 1892, this was increased to 235 feet and in 1926 to 250 feet. However, these distance, distances had little effect on the explosion of home runs starting in 1920. Baseball historians commonly referred to the period starting in 1920 as the lively ball era. During the First World War, good quality yarn was, was used for the war effort and baseballs were manufactured using inferior yarn. After the war, baseball manufacturers used a higher quality yarn, which allowed the baseballs to be wound tighter, 
especially when manufacturers began using machines in their process. The effect was astounding. In 1919, 447 home runs were hit. In 1920, 721 home runs. And in 1921, 1130 home runs. And I gave you also some additional years too, so that by 1925, you had 1,736. The lively of baseball, baseballs may have also been the result of a feud between the American League's founder and president, Ben Johnson, and John McGraw of the New York Giants. From 1913 to 1922, the Yankees were forced to play in the Polo Grounds, home of the Giants. McGraw was not a gracious host. Legend has it that the acquisition of Babe Ruth by the Yankees for the 1920 season made the Yankees a bigger draw than the Giants. Seeing an opportunity to increase attendance and stick it to McGraw, Johnson had the baseballs wound tighter, thus enhancing Ruth's popularity. The home run was not part of a batter's intention in the 19th century. At the end of the century, Roger Connor was the career leader in home runs with 138. Only seven major league players smashed 100 and more home runs by the turn of the 20th century. Connor held the all-time home run record until 1921, when he was left in the dust by Babe Ruth. Connor played for 18 years between 1880 and 1897. He had his best years with the New York Giants and earned admission to the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1976. George Herman Babe Ruth continues, oop, 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 wait, okay, wait. George Herman Babe Ruth continues to be remembered as the greatest home run hitter in the history of the game. He led the American League in home runs 12 times and astonished the baseball world by becoming the first player to hit 200 home runs, 300 home runs, 400 home runs, 500 home runs, 600 home runs, and 700 home runs in his career. He was the career leader in home runs from 1923 until surpassed by Henry Aaron in 1974. In 1919, Ruth set a single season record of 29 home runs. In 1920, now with the Yankees, he topped that with 54 home runs. In 1921, he set a new record with 59 and surpassed that in 1927 with 60. That record lasted until 1961 when Roger Maris hit 61 home runs. On May 25th, 1935, at age 40, in Pittsburgh, Ruth hit his last three home runs, one of which became the only home run ever hit over the right field bleachers in Forbes Field. Ruth would play in only five more games before he could no longer physically play due to injury and illness. Let's hope this works. On September 30th, the next to last day of the season, and needing just one more home run, he faced Tom Zachary of the Washington Senators. The first Zachary offering was a fast one which sailed over for a call strike. The next was high. The babe took a vicious swing at the third pitch ball and the bat connected with a crash that was audible in all parts of the stand. While the crowd cheered and the Yankee players roared their greeting, the babe made his triumphant, almost regal tour of the paths. And when he embedded his spikes in the rubber disc to officially Homer 60, hats were tossed in the air, papers were torn up and tossed liberally, and the spirit of celebration permeated the place. Sixty, count them, sixty, Ruth shouted in the locker room. Let's see some other son of a bitch match that. In 1947, the Pittsburgh Pirates installed an inner fence 
in a portion of Forbes Field, reducing the distance down the left field line of the ballpark by 30 feet. The purpose of the fence was to assist the team's newest acquisition, Hank Greenberg, in his ability to hit home runs. The area between the new fence and the outer wall became known as Greenberg Gardens. Greenberg had intended to retire after the 1946 season. The Tigers' ownership released Greenberg after Hank was photographed wearing a Yankee uniform during a war-era exhibition game. The Pittsburgh Pirates asked Greenberg what he wanted to agree to join the Pirates for the 1947 season. Greenberg stated that he wanted to be the first $100,000 player. The Pirates granted his wish. The Brooklyn Dodgers, Dodgers visited Pittsburgh early in the season. Jackie Robinson singled, and Greenberg and the Dodger rookie met for the first time. Green offered to help Jackie, stating that he too had been subjected to racial, racial prejudice when he entered the league in the 1930s. Maybe Hank Greenberg's greatest home run was hit on the last day of the season in 1945. He was discharged from the Army in 1945, having served almost four years in the service, he had not played in a major league game since early in the 1941 season. On July 1st, 1945, Greenberg rejoined the Tigers and hit a home run. Then on the last day of the season, on September 30th, no. the Tigers needed one win to capture no. the American League pennant. In St. Louis, in the ninth inning, with the Tigers losing three to two, Greenberg belted a grand slam home run to win the game and the pennant. The Tigers went on to defeat the Cubs in the World Series. Roger Maris got a bum deal from baseball. He was an average player on a couple of second division teams in, in the late 50s. Then in 1960, he was acquired by the Yankees to patrol right field in Yankee Stadium. The Yankees saw something in this kid from Fargo, North Dakota, because he exploded the plate, slugging 39 home runs in 1960 and an amazing 61 in 1961 to break Babe Ruth's record he had held for 34 years. But baseball had no intention of damaging the Bambino's image. No, sir. Ruth only needed 154 games to hit 60 while Maris got an ex extra help by playing in 161 games. Years later, Maris's place in history was reestablished. Then the steroid boys came to knock Roger back to earth. Mark McGuire hit 70 in 1998. Sammy Sosa hit 66 the same year. Barry Bonds set the bar very high in 2001 when he knocked 73 over the wall. And last season in the Bronx, Aaron Judge set an American League record with 62 home runs, topping Maris by one. Even today, Maris, who won two consecutive MVPs, gets little respect and no Hall of Fame consideration from veterans committees. He played in the shadow of the great Yankees like Mantle and Yogi Berra. But Roger Maris doesn't need to defend his credibility. McGuire, Bonds, and Sosa are not in the Hall of Fame either. Here's the wind-up. Fastball hit deep to right. It's going to be it. Way back there. Oh, he's going to Holy cow. What a shot. Willie Mays is the greatest living player and is considered one of the greatest of all time, and not just because he hit 660 career home runs. 
He had all the tools, running, throwing, catching, hitting, and power. 24 All-Star games, two MVPs, Rookie of the Year, 12 Gold Gloves, a batting championship, and of course, enshrinement in the Baseball Hall of Fame. On April 30th, 1961, this giant of the Giants became only the ninth player in history to hit four home runs in one game. He hit his four four baggers against the Braves pitcher Lou Burdett, Seth Moreland, Moorhead, and Don McMahon. In 1966, Mays hit his 512th home run, passing Malott and setting a new record for home runs in the National League. When he retired in 1973, Mays was third on the all-time list with 660 home runs. Today, he ranks sixth. Now, why didn't this... Oops, wait a second. There's a... Here we go. Braves meet the Giants in Milwaukee, and baseball history is being made by Willie Mays, who faces Lou Burdett in the first inning and promptly smashes his first home run of the day. Only eight men, including the great Lou Gehrig, have hit four home runs in one game. Today, Willie is joining that select circle. The Say Hey Boy was hitless in this series against the Braves until today, but he bounces back with a vengeance. His round tripper in the fourth is a 400-foot belt. The fences are bending today for other players on home run sprees, too. Before the game's over, there'll be ten circuit props, including the incomparable Willie's third blast in the sixth. Ball hit with everything behind it. The Milwaukee crowd is all for Willie now as he steps in the eighth and proceeds to poke his record-tying homer into the stands. Until today, Willie thought he was in a batting slump. Well, he found the cure by scattering baseballs into the bleachers. It was May's Day in Milwaukee as Willie found his page in the record book. Henry Aaron never hit more than 47 home runs in a season in his 23-year career with the Milwaukee and Boston Braves. And I'm sorry, Milwaukee uh, and Boston Braves. And yet... When he and Atlanta Braves, and yet when he passed Babe Ruth's record of 714 home runs in April of 1974, he did it with amazing consistency. I'm sorry, he never played for the Boston Braves. It was Milwaukee and Atlanta Braves. Um, he did it with amazing consistency. In his prime, from 1957 to 1973, he failed to hit 30 or more home runs only once. This Hall of Famer was a league MVP named to 25 all-star teams, won the 1957 World Series, won two gold gloves and two batting titles. Aaron's 755 home runs ranks second on the all-time list. From 1986 through 2007, Barry Bonds was a prodigious, prodigious slugger. In his early years with the Pittsburgh Pirates, he averaged 25 home runs per year, winning nat the National League MVPs in 1990 and 1992. In 1993, the San Francisco Giants signed Bonds to a free agent contract, and for the first few seasons, Bonds continued to slug the, the long ball, helped in part by favorable wind conditions, first in Candlestick Park and then at AT&T, now Oracle Park. Through 1999, Bonds averaged 38 home runs a year at Candlestick. After watching Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa grab the headlines in 1999, Bonds allegedly began to use banned human growth hormones. As he got older, his numbers skyrocketed. Bonds hit 49 home runs in 2000 and set a new record with 73 in 2001. From 2000 to 2005, Bonds averaged 51 home runs a season. He set a career record of 762 home runs when he retired in 2007. Bonds won four consecutive MVP awards in addition to the two he earned in Pittsburgh.
At the end of the 1951 season, the arch rivals, Brooklyn Dodgers and New York Giants were tied in the standings, forcing a best of three playoff. In the third game with the series tied, Bobby Thompson of the Giants hit a game-winning three-run home run at the Polo Grounds that is known as the shot heard round the world. This most dramatic home run was seen by millions on television, heard by millions more on radio, including thousands of servicemen in Korea listening on Armed Forces Radio. The Giants lost to the Yankees in the World Series. And no history of the home run would be complete without mentioning the splendid splinter Ted Williams of the Boston Red Sox. He had 521 career home runs and over 2,600 hits with an, an astounding 344 lifetime batting average. In the prime of his career, he was called to active service as a Navy pilot and served almost five years in World War II and Korea. On September 28, 1960, we bid adieu to the kid, but not before he hit a home run in his last major league at bat in the bottom of the eighth inning against Jack Fisher of the Orioles. Tony Kubek, Tony Kubek's last game as a Yankee was on October 3rd, 1965 at Fenway Park. His ninth inning home run off Dick Raditz was his last at bat in the major leagues, and he is the only Yankee to hit a home run in his final career at bat. Kubek was a rookie of the year, a three-time All-Star, and played in six World Series, winning three. He retired at the age of 29 due to back, back injuries. Joe Carter of the Toronto Blue Jays was the last player to end the World Series with a walk-off home run in the 1993 Game 6 with the three-run blast off Mitch Williams of the Phillies. Bill Mazarowski led off the bottom of the ninth inning in Game 7 of the 1960 World Series. With the game tied 9-9, Maz hit a game-winning home run off Ralph, Ter Ralph Terry that landed over the left field wall. Mazarowski's home run is the only seventh game World Series walk-off home run in history. 64 players in Major League history have ended their careers with a final at-bat. Hall of Famer Mickey Cochran didn't intend to be on that list. On May 25th, 1937, he hit a home run in the third inning. The next time he came up, he was beamed and suffered a fractured skull. He never played in another game. Ernest Thayer is most famous for creating the poem Casey at the Bat in 1888. By then, the magic of the home run had begun to take the imagination of the sporting public. If only Casey, mighty Casey, could get a turn at bat, Mudville could turn defeat into victory. Again, Jared Diamond in his book Swing King stated that the 2019 season was just further proof that baseball has fundamentally changed in ways that have led to an entirely new version of the game. Sure, the trappings have remained the same. The players throw the ball, they hit the ball, and they catch the ball, just as they have done for 150 years. But the product on the field is unlike anything the sport has ever seen, forcing a $10 billion industry to consider how much further the state of play can continue this way. Before the sport has for so long been known as America's pastime, becomes completely unrecognizable. As home runs have soared, so have strikeouts, with Major League Baseball setting a new record in that department every year since 2008. The humble single has fallen to new lows. Baseball today is about one thing, power and how to cultivate it. Baseball has evolved in many significant ways, but the fascination with hitting the long ball has never changed in the past 50 years. And the establishment has catered to this love affair with home runs and home run hitters. The baseball was changed to increase velocity. Of velocity. The pitching rubber was moved back. The mound raised and lowered over time. The game saw players use substances to increase their power and performance. 
Stealing bases and the hit and run play are nearly extinct. And the hated strikeout, no one cares about that anymore. Certainly not the magnates who operate the game today. Will this trend continue? Will banning the shift or putting a time clock on pitchers influence the product of the modern day slugger? Probably not, because the bottom line is the home run, which excited fans in the 19th and 20th century continues to dominate the headlines as we see millions of dollars being paid to those sluggers who can excite even the town of Mudville because we all know that Casey was going to come to bat again next season. I have a uh, my sources. So comments, questions. Everyone I was going can unmute at this point if you like. Great to participate in Q and A and discussion with Sam. You know, one of the things you just mentioned, Sam, was was talking about the pitch clock and the change in um, how the game is played. <clears throat> This is going to be a watershed year for Major League Baseball, of course, with all the different uh, rules and regulations that everyone is still getting used to in spring training. We've already seen a game that was a clock off finish where somebody got called strike three because he wasn't ready. I wonder, what is your take on how it's going to affect the number of home runs or or slugging percentages uh this year do you think you're going to see a drop in power numbers at all or do you think this is going to it's going to stay consistent with the you know the what the three true outcome uh idea i think for the first part of the year yes i i do see it i think there'll be a drop off as batters who like as 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 um, Peter Alonzo says, I step out only to get my head back on straight so that I can think through what my next move is. He doesn't have that time anymore, and the players don't have that time time anymore. However, the other thing is that pitchers are going to have to make pitches again. I mean, they're going to have to throw the ball and within twenty, you know, fifteen or 20, 20 seconds. And they won't have the time to step around and, you know, and, and, and think through. So I think eventually it's, it's the, it will comp, there'll be a compensation and we'll get back on track with, uh, with, with the long ball. But I think um, another factor would be, is going to be, we're going to see more base stealing. And when you see more base stealing, you see hitters have to have to protect the plate more. Um, they can't just swing swing wildly. So I think for the first first half we'll see down, and then then we'll see rise again. What do you think? What does everyone I, else I, think? I think the Mets pulled in their fences in right field for just such an emergency. <laughs> to be honest with you, uh, last year we saw Baltimore push their Put left it, push field it out out because they are concentrating on developing um, pitching. Pit, pitching, and right? They've done a heck of a good job of it, uh, from what I can see. But with um, so the Mets have pulled their fences in. I believe uh, Toronto and Detroit have also altered their ballparks to have shorter fields. I mean, Toronto was like, or excuse me, Detroit was like playing in the polo grounds in in yeah. some eras because that thing was cavernous. Yeah. So I, you know, you, you combine the the rule changes and how they're going to play off of altered dimensions you might be right you might still see home runs increase yeah i'm just looking at uh, some of the uh, comments on the uh on the chat uh so alan nathan has a great comment right now al is going to be presenting to, our, to us okay. in a couple, couple of weeks on Mickey Mantle's uh, 565-foot homer at Griffith Stadium. As a matter of fact, he's going to be presenting on the uh, 70th anniversary of that home run. We ha happen to get lucky and right. have that date available. But he said that, um, where to go? P home runs per innings pitch have decreased 20% since 2019, which is something uh, I did not realize. Alan, can you comment to that? Yeah, please? I'd like to know. Yeah, yeah no, uh, sorry. It's, it's not home runs per inning 
pitch. I may have typed it wrong. It's yeah. home runs per ball and play. Oh, ball and uh, play. Okay. So, yeah, have de- so basically home run rates, I think, uh, have actually decreased by about 20% uh, since 2019. 2019 was the high point, as, as was pointed out before. But uh, the short season, 2020 was down. Right. 2021 it was down, 2022 down even further. So already that's starting to correct itself. Uh, my own prediction is that uh, it'll, uh, it may stay steady, but I don't think it's going to, in- I actually don't think it's going to increase. Be- I think that uh, be- because of uh, uh, outlawing the infield, the extreme infield shifting, I think it's going to, have an effect. I think with the infield shifting, um, basically you're you're taking away the sort of the line drive that just clears the infield, um, and so it uh, that uh, uh, what batters can do that you know since you don't have that kind of contact hit, uh, you might as well just go for the fences. And I think the, I think this is going to correct itself to some extent. So I, 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 a, a, a good deal of uh, a good fraction of the increase in home runs we saw in uh, prior, you know, up to 2019 is is really a change in batter behavior. They're they're literally going for the fences because yeah. the, right. the because the single has been taken away. Right, because there's been a fundamental change in the way that hitting coaches approach batters with about launch angle and right. that has been a fundamental change over the last several several years if you look at Aaron Judge when he first came into the high minor leagues he changed his launch angle and began to and and that was and, and that was been going on for the last that's a trend yes i agree hi sam uh, yes question about the Ruth era, um, and I don't know if I have a good question formulated in my head. I'm just thinking out loud of moving from the dead ball era to the home run era, and how, of course, the you know the story you've always understood is nobody had seen Ruth hit anything farther, and all of a sudden money signs were in their heads and things like that. You know, like we got to make him from a pitcher to a hitter because of this great potential. But yet you look at the stadiums that were built at that time that were still pretty well new. There wasn't anything really considered. I don't think a hitter's park other than Fenway, I suppose. Um, How did we go from that dead ball era to all of a sudden home run was a thing. I'm curious about that. um, What you know about that. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is the, the baseball itself. They made fundamental changes in baseball, but, they changed the baseball in the past the baseball would get muddy Brown. And it was, and remember games usually started what three o'clock in the afternoon. So by the end of the game, it was dark and the balls were dark and it was hard, hard you know, it was much harder to see it, but now they're changing the ball. The ball's white again, and it stays consistent o- over the course of a game. So that was, I think the factor. Plus I think look at what Ruth, who Ruth was. He was larger than life. Yeah. Players wanted to emulate him. They wanted to, they saw the home run, people cheering and stuff like that. So there was kind of a, he's, you know, he set a standard. And I think that's why we began to see in the twenties, you, as I showed you in the chart, how right. home runs began to change. What do you think? And, and well, and yet just a decade before Cobb was the one and completely different style and philosophy of hitting. Right. Um, and, and I guess around 1940, 1950, you still had people arguing about who was the greatest of all time. Right. Um, right. And there's a great story that Cobb, uh, and if you read, and I highly recommend uh, uh, the Swing Kings, there's a story in the Swing Kings that Cobb poo pooed Ruth and said, I could hit home runs. And this was, I think, in 1923 or 24. He went out and he hit three home runs in one game and two the next. And he says, I can do it if I wanted to, but that's not the game. He said, that's not the game. I don't know if someone, I don't remember the data, but, but I know yeah. that, but, but that's the story in, 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 in that book. Thank you. Very interesting. 
Uh, I was going to throw out, and I told Bruce, uh, if if people remember the the most famous home run they ever witnessed uh, in person or on television or listening on the radio, if you'd like to share, you know, your favorite home run, that you know, anyone have any favorite home runs? My favorite story about the home run. I'm sorry, Donna. Do you want to go? I've yet to no, no, no. go ahead. Go, go, go. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, my favorite story about home runs, and and uh, some of us on the on the call tonight have heard this story. Uh, my first ball game was September fourteenth, nineteen seventy five. I saw Milwaukee and Boston. Uh, Billy started for the Red Sox and gave up what he thought was Henry Aaron's final home run. It was number 745. <clears throat> it was the only home run he ever hit at Fenway Park. And uh, I saw a quote a little while back from Bill Lee, who liked to joke about the fact that he was angry at Aaron for signing with the Brewers in 76 and erasing his name from the record books. <laughs> <laughs> Donna, go. You, you were. I, I stepped on you. No, 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 it's okay. I was gonna say I can't pick just one, but one that I did witness in person that I thought should have been on the list of famous home runs. And I have a feeling that in this regional area, a lot of people may have issue with this. But Aaron Boone's home run in uh, the 2003 ALCS to knock the Red Sox out and go on to the World Series. So, so I see Gary uh, right. I see Gary applauding because I know he's a big Yankees yes. fan. And Donna, I got to tell you, that's not the one I thought you were going to use. Well, then well, there's then there's uh, Robin Ventura's uh, ho home run single in the night 2015. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think it was in the championship series. Yeah. I, I lost my. I had no voice for a week after that game. I had no voice oh, for a week. But what? Which one did you think I was going to pick, Bruce? Oh, come on, Donna. You, you, Bucky? You... And Bucky yeah. Denko. Yeah. Yeah, but Bucky wasn't, Bucky wasn't a, a game ending, so it wouldn't have been on, on that list. Yeah, that's, Mike Torres. Well, Mike Torres, true, right? Oh, it, it was about as ending as okay. you can get without, <laughs> without being the end. It was deflating. But, but, but I, I, wasn't, I wasn't there for that. The Boone one, I was in the ballpark, and it was phenomenal. It was great. Wow, you know, we've only been around as a chapter now since last November, but but uh, membership is starting to come in hot when it comes with the Red Sox Yankees stuff here. I'm getting worried. <laughs> Love, it. But Love course, it. I was also there in 2004 for game six and game seven and saw things go not so my way. So Now, what about uh, the Henderson home run in the 86 championship series against the angels right wasn't that was a big one too carlton fisk's home run in 75 that's World another series. i was there right. mm -hmm. yeah i was yeah. there yeah. standing room you, only, i was there were you? <laughs> that's a big one too yeah whereabouts were you in the ballpark carol um i was standing on the first base side at the uh top of the reserve seats Oh my gosh. So I was with my dad and a bunch of congregational ministers, because of course my dad was a minister, about 10, 12 rows back from the field behind the dugout. Oh, so wow. geographically, you and I were far away from each other. That was, I was I was sitting between section 16 and 17. I had standing room only also, just sitting in the aisle, which the ushers allowed us to do for some reason that game. <laughs> Perfect view right down the third baseline. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Another one that was a favorite was Tony Canigliero hitting a home run in 1965, a game I was at. So um, he, he was a favorite player back in those days. Just so many terrific, memorable shots that we've all seen on TV. We've all had the chance to witness in person. I mean, the, you know, touch them all, Joe. You'll never hit a home run bigger in your life, you know. Aaron's, Bonds, everything we've talked about. I'm sure everybody here has one that they can remember. Another one that was one of my favorites was seeing Daniel Nava in his first oh, at-bat yeah. in the major oh, league in yeah. a grand slam. Yeah. I heard that on the radio. It was terrific. 
and then come up again with the bases loaded his second at bat, which he did not do it again. <laughs> <laughs> then there was uh, Fernando Tatis Sr., who hit two Grand Slam home runs in the same inning for the Cardinals. Yeah. What? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Came up twice and with the bases loaded twice in the same inning. Of the same pitcher. Uh, that I don't know. Someone will have to help me out on that one. <laughs> I hope not. But <laughs> <laughs> April uh, 23rd, I think, was that? No. It was 99. I think they were both off Channel Park. Um, um, they were both off Channel Park. I a story on it now. April 23rd, 99. That's right. Um, I'm scrolling down quick trying to use my Cardinals phone. and the Dodgers. No, yeah, Cardin mm -hmm. yeah, yep, I believe he's right. It was off the it was off park each time. Wow, I think the one that bounced off Jose Canseco's head over the wall. He doesn't like being reminded of that on social media, he gets a little mm. miffed when you remind him of that. <laughs> Like, so so the, the 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 longest home run I ever saw in person was I think in the uh I saw Richie Allen who was playing for the Phillies at the time at Shea Stadium. Home. At Shea Stadium, hit a ball that hit the batter's eye. It's straight away center field. And that was the longest home run I've ever seen. I've ever seen hit in person. I don't know. See, are you allowed to call him Richie Allen or Dick Allen? I don't know. Uh, it, uh, what did he like toward the end of his life? I like forget. Dick. Dick. Dick said, don't call me Richie. Okay. Dick, Dick Allen. Uh, when I um, give this talk on the mantle uh, uh, 556 foot home run, uh, I, I'm also going to mention two other home runs. Uh, the Ted Williams red seat home run. Uh, and the mantle facade home run, the one that hit the, that just missed going out of Yankee Stadium and hit the top of the facade. So I'll I'll, I'll bring those up uh, towards the end of my talk on on the mantle home run. Mm. Mm. That that talk will be on April seventeenth, which is the seventieth anniversary of Mantle's home run. As I said earlier today, Alan has graciously uh, agreed to present his data and his research that night. Well, I'm real grateful, Alan. Thank you very much. Can't wait for that one. That's going to be a, that's going to be a good night. Yeah, no, it was, uh, it was working on that was a fun project. I was actually working with initially with Jane Levy on this yeah. when she was writing her biography of Mantle. It was, it was funny when, when we did first discussed you presenting was it, the day before I I had just finished that part of the book, chapter it like six. The, chapter six was like the stars aligned. I'm like I'm talking to Alan Nathan. Holy cow! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Andy <laughs> yeah. hey, Heckroth, are you raising your hand? Did you have? Did you want to contribute, my friend? Yeah. Um, oh. So I had a probably the one homer and I were, um, was actually last. Uh, yeah, I made sure to drive from South Bend, Indiana to St. Louis so I could see Albert Pools' his last home game at, at oh, Bush, Bush Stadium. And I saw him hit 702. I remember you telling me this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, like I have an interesting anecdote, actually, uh, that doesn't, it's not about me, actually. It's about a colleague of mine uh, who was in the stadium when Blondes hit his 73rd. He was in Bush Stadium when uh, McGuire hit his 70th. Mm -hmm. And he was in Yankee Stadium when Maris hit his 61st. Wow. Oh, wow. I bet there wow. aren't more than a handful of people who can make that, that mm -hmm. the claim that they saw all three of those. Maybe they were play. I don't, I don't, players or coaches, but I. I yeah. can't believe. Yeah. That's it's, like, isn't that an amazing, he, that's like getting hit by tickets. lightning three times. I yeah, could, I could make that claim. Who can make it? I, I, I could. It wasn't true, but I could make the claim. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Bill Nolan is everywhere. I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Sam, I don't necessarily have a legendary home run. 
but it's what kind of got me interested in baseball. Is that an okay one to share? Absolutely. So my dad was blessed with all girls. And he grew up in a family where he was the oldest of five and there was three girls in the middle and a cherished little boy at the back end. And they lived in the country and they played baseball, they rode horses and had a country life. I grew up in suburbia and we had a nice big backyard and we started learning how to play baseball at a young age with paper plate bases. And my father quickly learned that I was very good at the line drive and had to put the hatch back up on the Plymouth Horizon because I nearly blew out the back um, <laughs> hatchback and took out the trunk's window. And one time my sister nearly took out the garage windows. So we had in the garage home runs and in the trunk home runs. And then our foul lines were the big trees and the hedges. Yeah. And the neighborhood kids would all come. Oh, okay. Maybe and eventually that, yeah. like, you know, dad kind of retired and was like the umpire sitting on the back steps watching us play baseball. And that was what, about five years ago? Ten, six years? Ten. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Longer than you would believe. Now, 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 come on, now, come on. That's what. That's 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 my wife. Uh, she, she's not. Uh, I, I I hate to put it this way, Molly. She's not that young. Come on. Okay, okay. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that's you know th those story. Th that's a great story, and I'm sure we all have stories about you know uh, growing up and pl and playing the game, which we all love. I mean, that's why we're here tonight, right? To to talk about the game we love. And these are all great stories. All your memories. Are, are really great and it's fantastic to get together and do this i really i really appreciate it do we have anything else uh tonight for sam in q a no, i'm mute i'm mute right. yeah. i i'm thinking and i just realized my my dad briefly my dad played semi-pro baseball in mexico when he was an embassy guy in the marine corps in the 50s but what just jogged my memory was when he was a Marine on Saipan in 1945, they had pickup games among the different squads on the island after the, the, the fighting had ceased. And that was the beginning of the last push to Japan. And they had a pickup game and they had the local guys calling the game. And my father went up to the ballpark, to the plate and hit the ball and he recalls that his buddy said um my father's last name was was sermon and he said sermon nonchalantly knocked one into the cane fields which was the home run barrier in saipan and i can attest to that because i was stationed in guam and visited saipan and my dad years later came and visited me while i was on active duty in guam and we went back to saipan and found that area of the island where that had occurred so that's mm. kind of the famous home run that i kind of cherished and not mm. thinking of major league baseball but he that was our start with baseball was that story which was yeah. very so anyway I, I didn't include in my talk tonight and inside the park home runs which is a mm. whole a whole nother thing and which i'm reminded is, yeah we're, i'm reminded that uh, for those of you who are into little trivia that while Babe Ruth hit the first home run in Yankee Stadium, he did not hit the first World Series home run in Yankee Stadium. Hmm. That was Casey Stangle in and in, in inside the park home run. So I think it was 1923. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. All right. Well, this has been just fantastic. Uh, th what, this what a great presentation. Some great conversation. Uh, Sam, I want to thank you very much for doing this this evening. It's been a, just a delight to have you into the Northern thank England you. chapter. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, next week, noted Sabre author David Krell will join us. He's going to be presenting his new book, Do You Believe in Magic? Baseball in America in the Groundbreaking Year of 1966. Monday night, 7 o'clock. Join us, won't you? Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Good seeing you all.